Um, the contemporary equivalent of television, I think I don't need to say, I, I mean, many of you are probably watching it now. I hope you're not. Um, is, um, you know, the iPhone. Uh, um, it's a much more accelerated form of, um, uh, of media. But what happened uh, after um, uh, the war ended was that a number of inventions, as technological inventions that were previously military have become uh, uh, popularized, meaning it's been released to, uh, for mass consumption. Um, and the kind of technology will also begin to lead into other inventions. For example, and you will see in the 50s onwards, the rise of a lot of um, multinational com uh, corporations that uh, go into um, the mass media, um, into various electronics. So um, the television is one. Um, in terms of speeds, uh, in terms of travel, um, again, not the invention of the airplane, which of course happened much earlier, but the mass um, of mass travel that the first commercial airlines uh, that anybody, not just the military, before that, um, the airlines that did international travel before 1947 were mostly military uh, for mail. So uh, after, uh, after the war, that's when we begin to see commercial um, travel that um, if you can afford it, um, you can travel. Uh, and uh, no longer just using uh, the, the steamliner or by, uh, by train or by, um, or by, uh, or by uh, sea. Um, <coughs> this second phase of uh, shift and speed is very significant. Um, I don't know if Chow covered Kabuzi, I'm sure he did last week on space. So what happened before um, the airplane was, uh, uh, was commercialized and become a mass, uh, um, something where, uh, become a mass consumption commodity was that for architects, they were really still imagining its possibilities. But from the 50s onwards, we see how did it affect architecture. If you look at when all the international airports were built across the world, you can actually date them to around 1950s and beyond. You suddenly realize that architects never before had to build airports. But like how do you actually design airports? It became a new kind of um, architectural type, uh, architectural building, in, uh, which is, um, uh, and every time a new architectural type emerges, it is where experimentation can happen. Uh, I'm not going into detail for all these today, but just to identify to you that a lot of the, uh, that what as a student of architecture, I'm still one, to learn is that a lot of seemingly large issues that don't seem directly related to architecture at first, uh, um, if you really look at it carefully, have uh, either direct or very implicit or indirect relationship to architectural ideas, how we think about buildings, how we think about uh, architecture, or how we build. Um, so not only were there airports, um, then this idea of terminals and uh, the notion also of um, time, um, that basically if you had to take a few months before to travel from one place to another, now it's a matter of hours, what this really means to the understanding of cities. Um, another phenomenon right after the war is mass production. Again, many of these, uh, it wasn't the war that suddenly the, this idea of mass production appeared, but the, these ideas were already much, uh, uh, after, uh, during, uh, after World War I, they already started thinking about that. Uh, the first kind of mass-produced cars were in the 19, uh, in the turn of the 20th century, so it was a few decades ago. But what happened in um, after 1940s was that there was much more technological know-how, and also, if you think about it, the war had also been very effective in. Um, fine-tuning the mass production process because they had to build ammunition really fast. Um, and also um, tankers and uh, all the kind of things related. They have to mass produce these. 
So the mass production um, process was much more streamlined. What this means for architects uh, during this time in the 50s was how do we think about that when the war is over? How do we harness the um, technological knowledge of mass production? So uh, what this time was matched with was the huge demand for housing. Um, a lot of people need homes. So um, a lot of the experimentation was happening in, uh, in home building. Like how do we build a home cheap and fast? So all um, different experiments, this one which still survived today if you visit uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania or New York, which is actually uh, uh, Lavitt, uh, uh, are two brothers who are developers and they came up with a way to build a very quick uh, mass produced house in two weeks uh, and it cost a few thousand dollars. This is an advertisement from the brochure to show you that, you know, uh, it can house a very happily family of five and you can get it for a few thousand dollars for, um, it, and it can be constructed in a number of weeks. There were much more um, radical experiments like this, um, which is designed by a really crazy architect, engineer, mathematician figure called Fuller, um, who uh, got a grant to experiment on how do you use the exact same process that the Ford car, uh, Ford is the, um, the first uh, car manufacturing company in the US. How do you, how does, how does the whole um, industrial process of producing a car, how can it be used to produce a house? So what he did was went into Ford factory and started to use the same process, but the output of it is not a car, uh, but a house. So this was a prototype that he developed in 49. Um, there were others, uh, there were many in the 50s who were experimenting, not just architect developers, because it's really, um, in fact, developers did a better job selling theirs than the architects. A lot of the architects won't remain as prototypes. They were very experimental. Um, this other architect uh, worked with a few others to come up with a whole bunch of manufactured homes, they call it, where um, a little bit different from this, this was using the exact material that Ford used for the cars. This was really looking at the different industrial um, materials that were coming out that were being mass produced very fast, like 4x8 plywood, um, very quick aluminum parts, um, corrugated pieces, and all the different materials and technology, and how do you quickly assemble them uh, and to tap into the manufacturing uh, expertise. So um, as you can see, that it wasn't just the invention of uh, the automobile industry or so on, but they actually really trickle. Architects were really constantly seeking for what is happening in the world. Um, and also the currency of um, uh, the urgency of uh, what's happening around. So this is an example of uh, these, these houses. It's not only at the scale of the building, but this is the entire um, area of uh, Levitt Town. This is, uh, so each of these houses uh, is this one. And basically it's uh, what you see, mass produced, mass production house. That's how you look like. Everyone equally spaced apart. Um, each one has a front uh, lawn and a back garden. The house can be built in a few weeks. What this means is it also changes the face of what the city looked like. Um, 1950s for the US and for certain parts in Europe was a massive phase of uh, suburbanization. Okay, marching forward, what other inventions came about that were still perpetuating? The skyscraper, uh, except they were much lower then. Uh, for a number of reasons. Technologically, in the 50s, they couldn't figure out that high yet. So one of the most famous ones, which you will encounter later in the architectural study, uh, is the one in New York by a very famous German architect, Mies van der Rohe, um, the Seagram building. What is significant in this building isn't so much just the design, or the, uh, and I will not get so much into detail with that, but the fact that in order to get this high, um, something has to be traded off. And this is what is interesting. Because when we are looking at architecture, especially in the urban, we cannot think of it at, in itself. We have to think of it in the context of 
um, the, the neighborhood, the area, as well as the entire city. What this project did, what, which was why it was considered modern and a brick from previous high-rise building. Think about it, the Empire State Building was pretty high. It was higher, actually. The Chrysler Building was even higher. So why is this so significant? Was the fact that um, of the public plaza in front, that the ability to go high was um, a trade-off to offer the public plaza on the ground. So what you see in cities, uh, uh, well, going uh, is it happens in Hong Kong too. Go go take a look around. That this is a kind of exchange between um, the the owner of the building and the city. This is a trade off. So um, uh, if you go high, what you do, what you have effectively done is you are dominating um, the city skyline. What you which means that you have to something have to give back. So of course, if you um, historians have looked at this building and analyzed it in terms of technology and so on and so forth, which is completely also very accurate analysis. But I want to draw your attention to something that's less discussed, which is really the relationship between uh, high rises and the city. I will get more into that also towards the end. Okay. Um, as I shown you earlier, the after 1947, um, over a hundred nations in the world became independent nations. Before that, they had no idea that they were their own place. So this question of identity was huge um, from uh, the 40s onwards. India, Singapore, uh, well, Singapore was 60s. India, um, uh, certain of the African nations. All over the world, the, Indi the newly independent <coughs> nations were trying to um, kind of build its national identity. Architecture plays a very big role because it is visual, it is spatial, uh, it, is, um, it is also habitable. Uh, for, it's for people. Um, so it plays a very huge role in participating in the national identity, the building of the nation. And a lot of books have been written about that, looking at different nations and how architecture play a significant role in it. I'll give you an example of this, this is, uh, which you will also encounter probably in the next few years. This is a, a new uh, capital uh, called Shang Shandiga, which uh, was commissioned um, by uh, the uh, commissioned by the Prime Minister um, Nehru. And this was the master plan, and, the, uh, and what uh, was actually uh, you are seeing here by this uh, Swiss-French architect, Le Corbusier, uh, is the capital of the entire uh, newly planned city of Chandigarh. What you see is a very na uh, rational Cartesian grid, uh, grid 90 degrees, um, in which you can understand the logic of movement around it. It is also spaced very far apart to anticipate a modernized infrastructure, modern way of traveling, mainly by the car. Um, and uh, the landscape runs in the rational way inserted uh, within it, right, you see. Um, and what uh, Corbusier focused his attention on was how to begin to, um, he's, com he's coming from, you know, a Swiss-French tradition, coming to somewhat a kind of tro non tropical, arid tropical condition, tasked to build modern symbols, things that are on the one hand modern, but also respectful of the cultural tradition. So um, this become for him uh, a way to test out some of the ideas that he had of how to kind of manage modernism, modern architecture, and um, local conditions. So for him, one of the main uh, experiments were in how to deal with the facade, the, the skin of the building. How do you make the building breathe? So there were a lot of um, tests on that. Uh, so till next time. Um, I feel that since we are where we are, it's important to also show you what uh, was happening uh, at the same time in China. The same process was going on, even though this is internal. Whereas uh, India was a new colony, it became a colony in the late 40s, uh, sorry, uh, independent nation in the late 40s. It didn't quite have its own master architect uh, that uh, 
that Nehru felt could really give it the symbolic uh, identity. So he invited a foreign architect um, to come and sort of participate in the design of a new national identity. In China's case, uh, in the 50s, um, something was happening uh, simultaneously. It was a kind of consolidation, post-1949, reconsolidation of China as uh, an, an identity. So one of the first major acts uh, was to enlarge Tiananmen Square. So in the 1950s, Tiananmen Square was significantly enlarged uh, from, if you look at like 50 years before that, it was a lot smaller and still very vernacular looking. But um, Tiananmen Square was, oops, sorry, was modernized. The wall was reconstructed so that it looks like a modern uh, structure, even though it was a 400-year-old structure. And um, same thing, in the 50s, housing was very significant. Um, the rise of public housing. Public housing is a very new phenomenon. Across the world, public housing is uh, less than 100 years old. So we always feel like uh, public housing is a lot older than we think, but it's a very new thing. And uh, public housing all over the world was really consolidated in the 50s as well. So you can see why I'm, uh, it's important and we're very fascinated with this period because all these same issues are very with us today. So um, modern architecture, or at least how we, uh, how mo the, the idea of um, the modern aesthetic, the kind of clean um, uh, understanding of uh, repetition, um, the geometric uh, resolution of the design and so on, became the main, uh, should I say stylistic, uh, as the, the aesthetic for most of this housing project, mainly because there's this idea that they're quick to build, very easy to rationalize, you can lay it out, you can subdivide all the housing units in a very rational way, rationalized way. So for all the housing designers and architects, this kind of modern uh, look, modern design, uh, makes a lot of sense to roll out a lot of housing projects. So this is in the US, uh, uh, this is in Hong Kong. The housing um, program really started in the late uh, 50s. Okay, um, finally, um, we get into the 60s where uh, mass media, uh, and this is what we're talking about now, is extremely significant. What does this mean? This means that not only do we know our own identity, but there is an understanding that the world is one home, one place. And how is this possible? Uh, if you ever heard of the word global village, it was coined in the 60s and popularized in the 60s. Um, and it really suggests uh, that, you know, even though you probably in your entire lifetime will never go there, we don't even know where that is, somewhere in Papua New Guinea or somewhere out there in some lost island. But because of mass media, we know that we are, uh, even though we're in Hong Kong, very high dense, very modern, we know that this is the same world. So the entire world is simultaneously in your home, in your phone, a tip, fingertip away. So there is a kind of idea that um, the entire world is one big village. So because of that, what did architects learn about this? Um, 50s, 60s, the rise of cybernetics, the first IBM computer came up in the late, uh, in 48, I think, or something. And architects were very fascinated also. First of all, uh, there are millions of architects in the world. So when I say architects, there are different architects picking up on any one of these issues or more that I have talked so far and dev devoting their life work or their whole work uh, around these ideas. So there are a few um, uh, that actually started exploring into cybernetics and uh, network technology and so on, and how do they actually sort of inform human experience. So this is an experimental theater uh, meant for London. There were others that were even much more fascinated, not only with uh, the kind of technology, cybernetics, uh, uh, computer um, knowledge uh, of um, understanding of bits and um, data, but also uh, with mass media, with mass culture, 
Um, so in this case, these architects were really interested in um, uh, not just uh, technology, but also popular culture. So you see this is an example of what if um, cities can walk. Okay, uh, how am I with time? I have no sense of when this class ends. Around 12.50. Oh, okay, I'm good then. I, I'm halfway, this is the halfway point. Uh, a little over halfway. Okay, so all these things, the 60s is a fascinating thing. And, uh, and um, if, if you're in architecture class, you will get actually a lot of weeks on the 60s as well. Um, but what we're going to look at is from the 70s to now, all right? Okay, sometime in 1972, it's a very precise time. I think, what was it, 8, eight something a.m. in the morning. Uh, there was a newscast because everyone had a TV now, right? Not just in the living room, but in every room in the house watching the morning news and the first one of the first image they see is um, the collapse of this. I don't know if you guys, uh, the demolition of this. If you guys remember, um, that's this project. All right. So this project, when it was built in the 50s, won a lot of awards because the project was built in a previously slum area, very ghetto-ish, a lot of crimes, poverty, uh, it was a very, uh, a, a lot of, uh, it's basically uh, African Americans and it was just, so this project was seen in many ways to be a social project because it was meant to sort of clean up the area. Um, it didn't quite do it. So um, between 1951 when it was built and won all kinds of awards, um, and 1972, what happened was the areas around it, the neighbors around it um, started moving out. And uh, the building very quickly by the 60s fall into disarray. There were more crimes coming back in and graffiti everywhere. And uh, there was not sufficient uh, maintenance and policy and so on to such an extent that the city needed to do something about it. So in 1972, it started to demolish uh, the first section of it and incrementally over time started demolishing it. So this for a British historian, he's a theorist called Charles Jenks, become a reason for him to use as his, for, to announce that actually modern architecture is dead. So I want to pause in memoriam that modern architecture in 1972 to 16 March died. Why did he say that? Well, he said, you know, think about it. Modern architecture, he wrote a whole book explaining why modern architecture died. And the reason why he wrote that book is he wanted to explain what are the new architecture that is happening in the 70s uh, and forward that has very different ideals. So what he said was, the kind of modern architecture like this project uh, carry within them this big idea of it, uh, the improvement of society. That modern architecture was a, amongst other things, also a social project. A project uh, where the modern architecture can improve the area maybe, or uh, can really make us a better person. Uh, uh, you know, can really bring the community together. All these really uh, social ideals of, uh, um, uh, and also on the symbolic level, it can really stand for, um, you know, a kind of a democracy even. And there are a lot of projects in the U.S. that were put forth as democratic architecture. Um, so what he said was, let's take a look at around us how many. Uh, how many of these modern projects that make this claim of uh, the social actually worked? So they didn't, they failed. So that became a launch, launching pad for him to then uh, start looking at us, uh, to start talking about what are really um, going, what is going on around us. So uh, after this slide, I'm going to start looking at the 12 issues uh, very quickly. So, but uh, this uh, is a transition. Um, the year after this, this was, uh, the architect for this, it's the same architect for this. Um, this and this. 
So uh, Minoru uh, Yamasaki, who was the architect uh, for um, the Pruitt Eagle housing project in Misery, his project failed, um, not because of the architect, even though um, the architect often got blamed for all failures when it comes to buildings. Um, buildings are much more, a lot of other people were involved and complicated. What happened in the 70s, we see, amongst other things, uh, a very different phase that the world was going through. Um, so I cannot cover them all in like this time, but one of the biggest things was this notion of uh, the world that was reconsolidated. In the 1970s, the United Nations called for multiple meetings. Why? Because there's a new consciousness of the world including um, world trade. So in the 1970s alone, over 50 world trade centers were built in the world. We only know this few actually, but I found out there are actually a lot. And world trade center is meant every city who is up to the level of, uh, you know, um, able to compete like a metropolis in the world stage will have a world trade center. Hong Kong has a world trade center that was built in the late 70s as well, in Causeway Bay. Not as high as this one. Um, so a lot of the major cities uh, have World Trade Centers in the 1970s. What the World Trade Center do uh, in terms of its use was really um, the headquarters of all the kind of um, trade intersections, uh, trade and commerce. Uh, so it's really the kind of uh, control center for, uh, for world trade. Um, so that's what it's supposed to do. So uh, there was, in the 70s, a whole kind of um, a new consciousness of architecture in relation to the global. Another thing was the environmental awareness that um, the United Nations called an urgent meeting, uh, I believe it was uh, in 73 once and in 76, to discuss um, the environment of the world, ecology because there was somehow a report released that the ozone layer was uh, depleting and there were all these other consciousness that what is happening somewhere else. The, the age of the Anthropocene, if you ever heard of this word, <coughs> meaning man's <coughs> action someplace in the world is causing a reaction somewhere else and everything is interconnected. So this awareness so you see the whole period before the 70s of national identity, we're all consolidating our, our own identity. Suddenly in the 70s, there's a different awareness that it's not just about my country, that actually what I'm doing. So including the oil crisis in the <coughs> 70s and so on. So these few major ones started, um, so national governments, the United Nations started to kind of come up with a new uh, imperative urgency and how a lot of meetings and so on and uh, these are things that haven't gone away what uh, the kind of things that were occurring in the 70s are only really seeing its repercussions now for example the oil crisis is still very much fundamental for example to what was happening to the world in the last 15 years in terms of uh, global terrorism and so on so they are really connected why this is important I don't have an image of this uh, being demolished. Uh, and you guys probably know what happened in 2001 when the Twin Towers were um, hit by two planes uh, within an hour of each other and it's no longer there. That's the architect who's, oh, I'm sorry, uh, very proud uh, standing there with his uh, tallest tower in the world. Okay. So let's look at uh, contemporary issues. One, um, history. History came out some, came back in some, uh, um, very fiercely um, uh, from the 70s. History is always there, but history in the consciousness, you know, up to this point, a lot of architects, uh, especially um, those trained in thinking about modern must be kind of new, must be different, uh, reject the old because the old is bad, or the old is messy, dirty. Um, history came back uh, in a number of different forms, including everyday, you know, learning from the everyday life, learning from the people. So it's not just history in terms of like, uh, I'll show you a few examples. One is uh, history in terms of 
the contemporary, you know, like look behind your backyard, go out and look at the street and learn from them. So there's a whole group of architects in the 70s who are really learning from the everyday, the grassroots, the people. And then there are, uh, this is the contemporary example. I don't know who have been to the Venetian. It's behind us. You have, I should bring my daughter there. I think kids will like it. Um, what you see in the 70s, this is an example, there are a lot of examples, was the bringing back the quotation of history, quoting history. Um, so in this case, this is actually just the plaza of a shopping mall. I, I cropped out the shopping mall because the shopping mall would look like any typical um, uh, skyscraper. But what the architect decided is that for people who are entering the shopping mall, let's give you some references from history. So we have, uh, I counted, there are over 10 different styles from the last like um, thousand years, um, going to like Italian Renaissance to uh, uh, all kinds of um, Romanesque and different kind of uh, references and used in a very different way, used in an unexpected way. You know, um, the historians of the classics will turn in their grave, you know. Um, but this was the kind of, why? Because uh, architects realized that one of the issues that they learned from the, uh, the generation before them was that they felt modern architecture in the way that they were, um, they were stripped down and minimal were not relating to the everyday person, not, you know. Ask your mom, you know, do, do you think that they think Noel's building is really uh, nice? You know? My mom doesn't get it. Um, but the everyday person, the person who actually uses your space, the guy who goes shopping in the mall, gets it when they look at, um, you know, kind of historical uh, so on. So architects began to realize that, uh, and to start responding, learning from so-called so mistakes, or learning from their uh, precedents. But those were just one types of architects. Let's go the other extreme, where there are architects who said, you know, so architecture project uh, is, uh, architecture really cannot solve social problems, you know? So why try, you know? We have a lot to worry about in architecture itself, you know, how to get it to stand up, how to build it. You know, there's a lot of issues. Architecture, the building itself is already um, more than enough and complex. How can we even, uh, you know, how can architects even have like the ability to deal with Let the sociologists do it, right? Um, so there is a whole group of architects. Um, this is the uh, second issue. Um, even though I'm showing you a mix of examples that are in the last, uh, between now and the past, all these 12 issues are still uh, exist with us. I'm just showing you a bunch of examples. So those who deal with autonomous, thinking of architecture as its own, anybody not know what autonomy is? Autonomous, yourself? Um, in, in, uh, in that it doesn't need to refer to anything else but itself. Um, autonomy, independence. So um, architects like Peter Eisenman um, built a series in the 70s. He designed 10 houses, and each one were mathematical experiments, trying to figure out how to deal with geometry, structure, and construction. And uh, this house was actually built in uh, Vermont, which is in, a, which is in the East Coast of the US. And uh, as you can see, uh, he came out of the house first and uh, based on a set of mathematical principles and, exper and geometric experimentation. And then figure out what was the kitchen and the different uh, spaces and try to see how do you then start putting the bedrooms and so on. Um, this kind of uh, approach towards architecture uh, is still very prevalent. The fact that um, for some architects, um, they didn't feel that it's that necessary to deal with a lot of other issues that architecture cannot solve anyway. How about dealing with uh, architecture's own issues? And for them, it is materials, construction, form, style, and so on. Another example from Eisenman, um, where in the 80s, he experimented with the grid. You know, how do you play around with the grid? How do you kind of uh, understand the city as a kind of uh, 
geometric grid and then how does the architecture break the grid as a kind of uh, experiment uh, of um, experience. So for example, in this particular project, um, he had uh, worked out the main um, kind of uh, project complex as a kind of 90 degrees grid and for the circulation, the passage through it cut a diagonal grid to kind of um, uh, break it, to deconstruct the grid. And uh, by doing that, he created a series of kind of surprising or unexpected spaces that this kind of uh, diagonal grid created. So this was for him a very particular formal exercise, play with space. Um, Another architect, there were many, I'll show you some really classic examples and they were also our teachers. Um, so, and uh, this was, um, this particular, oh I didn't name it, this particular um, house is called the Wall House, also of the 1970s by um, John Hader, who is now passed, but he was for a long time the dean of the Cooper Union School in New York. And for him, he was really, this is a drawing for it, um, this is called the wall house, and he was really testing the wall, the, you know, the, the 90 degrees geometry with um, this kind of um, more organic forms. And uh, really experimented with that. He had a series of drawings on how the straight line and the curve and the straight, the geometric and the organic um, could be composed together. So it's a series of composition in itself. Uh, actually, okay, this is two, so sorry, I blocked it, but this is three. Um, the third issue that is still very prevalent uh, is the question of uh, the region. Um, in Hong Kong sense, it will be the Pearl River Delta. So not only was it the understanding of, so architects don't only think in terms of national boundaries anymore, like, you know, um, but in terms of what the region offers. The region, because before the nation, um, there is an understanding, for example, Malaya was a region. But after independence, there's Malaysia, there's Singapore. And, um, so, but yet there are a lot of shared resources and including climate, temperatures, vegetation, the kind of materials like certain kind of woods and teak and stone that was shared in the region that actually define national boundaries. So there are a number of architects uh, that were very uh, interested in recovering what are the kind of regional uh, um, kind of qualities in order to inform their architecture. So in China, there are more and more architects uh, in, like including um, uh, Wang Shu and other small famous ones who are really looking at what um, uh, regional qualities can offer to their architecture. This is an example by a very famous um, architect, uh, Finnish architect from Finland, who um, designed a really modest town hall, um, and his reference are uh, from all the kind of uh, uh, local barn houses, farm houses that were in the area. So even though this is a modern project, but he derived the kind of spaces and the form, as well as the material and the wood um, that he used from the, from the region, from the local um, uh, area, as well as from the um, local expertise. The carpenters have also um, has the same knowledge. To those who built the farmhouses were the uh, similar ones who actually were building this. So, um, there's a, in Australia, there are many architects also that work uh, along these lines. Um, at the same time, there are those in uh, Southeast Asia and other areas that were really thinking of the region, not just uh, in terms of materials and so on, but also in terms of symbol symbolic symbolism. Uh, and also in relation to climate. So you will see this, uh, this is in Sri Lanka in the 80s and the reference to the kind of uh, big roof because of the very strong sun and so on um, and for ventilation and so on. Four, te technology. Um, so 70s, 80s, all the way to now, there is already after the war you can see a belief in technology. 
um, that, techno that technological uh, advancement, innovation, is something that inform and underlie all architecture schools in the world. That basically, um, so you can really think about it, including the transition from drawing by hand to the computer, to, to, to you being able to draw in the computer, to letting the computer script the design, so you just punch in the program, uh, to robotics. Like the whole kind of belief that um, architecture can harness technology has, is still here and very prevalent. Um, in the 70s, there were many experiments thinking about technology. The most extreme ones are those like this, who actually begin to see technology in the building as the systems. So you see, you look around here, right? You don't see the air conditioning ducts and all the things that um, actually are required uh, in the modern building. What some of these architects did was to show you what it takes to actually uh, run the building. These are all the things, you know, the pipes, uh, the air conditioning, that's the water, sewage, everything. And um, to show you that actually this is the technology that, um, that runs the building. So this is a very famous example, Saint de Pompidou in Paris. Closer to home uh, in the 80s, we get the HSBC which was really um, an expression of uh, structural integrity and um, the entire um, building was presented as a technological response to the high-rise building. You know? So rather than showing you a skyscraper um, as the ones that uh, just show you the uh, glass um, skins and you don't know how it's um, held up, what the architect in this case, uh, Foster, uh, was to actually show you exactly how the building is held up, how it held itself up, how it was constructed, how it was clean. You will see that um, these are the cleaning devices. Um, and these actually are where the uh, forces are to resist wind load. And these are the bricks so that the building is thought of in sections so that it, uh, it can resist um, uh, the wind, uh, wind, um, wind pressure from the two directions. And uh, you also see the elevator, express elevator running up. I don't have an internal view, but internally you will also see um, the giant escalators that run throughout. So how the building operate, how it held up, how it's constructed is completely presented to you. No hiding. Um, more contemporary, um, so we are actually a little bit past this phase, um, you know, this was happening in the 80s, a little bit in the 90s, and after that architects say, you know, you don't really need to show off technology like that. Let's uh, harness technology differently. So we see um, projects like this, there are many um, that basically use the computer as a tool to produce forms that otherwise the hand cannot do. You cannot draw this in three dimensions. You can, however, the computer could three-dimensionally um, help you to kind of produce the kind of forms and volumes. At the same time, oh, at the same time in China, we get already houses that are completely uh, printed by the computer. This has um, actually been uh, rolled out already, uh, as far as I remember, in the last two years. So these are completely produced by uh, the computer. What's really interesting is that these are really um, very, very different kind of architecture. So you don't, you see that technology has been, uh, it has a very different look from this attempts to express technology. Here, technology become much more integrated into the production of um, the project. So in this case, sorry, it's the process of producing it. If you look at the architecture itself, what does it remind you of? Something, something, is it modern, not? What is modern is in the process of producing this project. S similar for this, um, that what is producing it is an extremely kind of modern technology that wouldn't have been possible before. Uh, number five, I'm a little bit slow, so I'm gonna speed up. Infrastructure. Um, Hong Kong is very, very good, uh, uh, offers many, many good examples from the 70s onwards. It's Major building projects in Hong Kong cannot be conceived without thinking about infrastructure. The NPR is a very big um, collaborator in this. So um, 
An example here is the Waterloo station, um, where you see that, look at this, this is an entire kind of uh, station that is both architecture and infrastructure in one. So is it a building? Or is it a train track? It's, uh, it's architecture and infrastructure. Other examples, a little bit 20 years ago, this is very advanced 20 years ago, actually. I remember studying this as a student. Um, that you see, is this a park? Is this landscape? Or is this a pier? Or is this a terminal? What we see now is a trending uh, and that has already been set in place for a few decades, but intensifying of um, thinking of uh, the scale of building in relation to the scale of architecture and landscape. They are much more integrated than ever before. Number six, ecology. Uh, I had told you um, that earlier that uh, the environment and the consciousness of the environment and ecology has also produced multiple reactions. These examples may be very weird to you, but there are many examples. Um, so for example, this was a memorial that was um, produced to basically memorialize all the thousands of victims that died because of the potato famine um, in uh, two centuries ago in Ireland. Uh, there are a lot of Irish people in New York, so this actually was uh, supported by the Irish uh, uh, population. And what is really uh, kind of particular about this is not just a memorial, it's a living landscape, meaning um, any every time you go, it's growing. It's not a static landscape. It's actually, um, there are different plots. Of, it's really a little farm. It's an agricultural, um, so they are growing different things in here. and. Uh, Every season, every month you go, it, it's a different. So it's a living memorial. Um, underneath, you see that uh, it is a building. So is this a building, a monument, a landscape? Um, and it really came about to memorialize an ecological disaster. Other, other issues about memorial, uh, about 13 years ago, um, this was a really uh, kind of experiment of uh, this building, if without the mist, um, it's actually just a frame. Oh, I should have shown you the frame, but actually it's called the Blur Building. And uh, unlike a typical building, it's a pavilion. And unlike a typical building where you actually have the walls, the wall of this building, or the enclosure of this building, is water vapor. So everybody has to wear a raincoat to go into this building. Um, it's a temporary uh, uh, building, so it's not there anymore, right? Yeah, I think it's taken down. It's in the middle of the lake uh, in, uh, in Geneva, and it was for the Expo, National Expo. So what was uh, very particular for these this particular architect was um, they were trying to uh, experiment with something that comes from the natural, the natural element of um, water vapor, the kinds that form clouds, you know, um, to use it to basically create the form of the building. So um, otherwise the building doesn't have a form, it only have a skeleton. These are just very little examples of all the kind of rising consciousness of architecture's participation in the environment and its critical role. Um, seven. The urban and uh, the country. The contemporary understanding of urbanization is very different from 50 years ago and very different from the turn of the century. Um, the understanding now of the urban is very much um, a kind of, uh, literally the urban is everywhere. This notion of the country versus the urban, which was an earlier idea, is fast disappearing. So we see China is a really good example, but we see in many places uh, in the world where the countryside is no longer kind of a neat bounded uh, nature versus uh, the city, but that they are both kind of coexisting. So the urban in, this, uh, in, uh, in the rural poses important challenges for um, architects. And many architects, including some of uh, the professors you are studying with have made it their um, 
their ex their their problem their the their work their life's work. One example of uh, trying to understand um, uh, the uh, the rural and trying to test it out in the urban. This is an experiment I have spoken with the architect. They said they were really trying to understand um, the Tulo. The Tulo was uh, very much a rural thing. The reason why they were round and they were so few windows and they were so fortress-like was because they wanted to keep out the wild animals, keep out the enemies, and so on. They were built from a different time. What happens when you learn from something that is built in a different time, in a different uh, kind of rural condition? What can you learn uh, about them when you think of them in an urban context? Uh, this was something, and how can they then uh, offer you possibilities to think back about the rural? The many architects working with these problems. It, um, the skyscraper is not going away. In fact, it's getting scarier than ever. So the world is in this crazy race, um, and it doesn't look like it's going to stop. So of trying to compete for the highest, the tallest, and uh, you see the last 10 years of uh, cheating going on. They started putting antennas. A lot of cheating going on. Uh, nine, cultural institution. In the last 10, uh, uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, starting with this one, I would say, amongst others, that put the museum on the global stage. So suddenly the museum is not just, you know, the national museum or the local museum where you show your own, uh, where you show local arts or modern arts that travel and so on. But the museum become this cultural institution that is the identity of that place. Anyone has ever heard of Bilbao? Anyway, before this museum, I've never heard of Bilbao. And I also had no intention to go to Bilbao. But in 1997, when Frank Gehry, the American architect, built this project, um, suddenly Bilbao became on the world stage. So think about China, for example, the, uh, and all the examples. Um, London, same thing. Um, not only the cultural, but uh, point 11, um, preservation. The idea of how many preservation students here? ACP? You don't have any ACP students? Okay, well, architectural heritage is a huge issue, very contemporary. A lot of us um, do not necessarily work with projects where you get the open land and just build. A lot of architectural projects now require you to deal with existing and historical conditions. So what does it mean? What do we need to teach ourselves in order to understand how to integrate the new and the contemporary in the old? So this was an uh, uh, old turbine station that become uh, a modern art museum. Oh, sorry, this should be not 10, but 12. Uh, community participation. Um, the getting, getting the community to participate in architecture. This was also a very, um, kind of a very, very contemporary issue that came out also from the 70s uh, when it became important to learn from the people how does architects work with the community to produce uh, meaningful projects that they actually want to live in? Finally, finally, public space. Um, the question of public space and architecture and its role in um, the city. Uh, this particular project is, uh, what, when it was built, it was very famous. Um, this, and. Uh, no, I didn't uh, label it. It's by a German architect called Jürgen Meyer. Um, it's about eight, seven or eight years old, and it was really just a public square. What happened was um, in 2011, there was a huge protest, very similar to Occupy Hong Kong, and uh, where this suddenly this architecture that was meant to be a nice public plaza become a place for protest. So architecture's role in, um, in public space and in public realm is also a very significant one. And many, student, many of your seniors here are also working with this problem, this issue. Um, so just to end with Hong Kong, because it's important, um, this question of public space. So we see this, and as architects, what do we think about this? 
um, politics aside, what this has actually shown um, is that what was previously designed as infrastructure, the street and the highway, do you still see the highway? Has completely become a public space. Um, in a city where public space is always negotiated, you get some public space here and there, you get some parks after all. What is really interesting is some architects had already responded to this event and make an argument for pedestrianizing central because they said, look at what has happened um, uh, over the last, over the few months in which um, what was previously designed for the car has been overtaken by people and it has shown that the city can really um, do with rethinking what its public spaces are, its environment. Um, my time is up, so uh, I want to end with just three questions. These are the three questions that sum up everything. What kind of new knowledge and collaborations um, to this kind of complex. Architecture is not long, new, no longer just some simple buildings, you know. You have to work with a lot of the knowledge and uh, with a lot of collaborators. What new forms of uh, social responsibilities do architectures take on? Like, what kind of architects um, and what kind of social responsibility? And finally, what do we do with those buildings that were modern? Because modernism keep going, uh, uh, modernity continues, development keep continuing. These are, these are questions of history and heritage. So I'm going to leave with that. Okay, thank you.